Good morning, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jarno Zaffelli, and I'm really sorry not to be able to be with you today. What we are going to present is matter about circuit safety taken to the road safety for every day. Okay, let's go to see what I mean as circuit safety. When we think of motorcycle riders, they fall following a line generally a little bit different from the bike encountering many kind of surfaces they can find asphalt they can find painted asphalt they can find gravel grass artificial grass or curbs and so my first focus since 2010 was to understand what was the behavior of uh, different materials encountered from the rider itself. Here there is a crash test at high speed on a lightweight aggregate. Here there is another crash test done on gravel. Here we were in Misano race track. And here again another crash test at 120 kph on asphalt. So what we found were a lot of information that were put in a system called DROCAS that has been certified last year by DECRA that now is a perfect model that works to predict motorcyclist falls and dangers. Let's see for example in Termas de Riondo, we just spoke about that racetrack, the first time that this system was applied to a brand new racetrack in the world and has been used to deploy all the medical staff and the track marshal by FIM representatives during MotoGP. Well, we hadn't got any information of this track because MotoGP never ran on it. So what we did was to run drawcasts that we used for uh, the design of the runoffs and giving data about the crash probability in the different part of the track. You can see here that in orange we can see all the area where more than 90% of the crashes should be concentrated. And then FIM medical representative put an ambulance, medical staff, depending on those areas. And what happened was that we had 36 crashes in three days. And I gathered all the, the video of the internal camera of this, those crashes and I rebuilt all the dynamic of every crash looking at statistic and mm, diagrams. And what I discovered is that 93% of the crashes were inside predicted areas that would host 90% of racing incident predicted before the event. And this is the result. You can see that we had most of all uh, of, the, of the crashes inside the orange area. The only one injury in red was in T5 on top right and was, um, was recovered directly from the ambulance because it was just in front of him. And this was a, a huge success for a first year event. Going more into deep, you can see here, this is T1. In T1 we had four crashes. With red line we can see the trajectory that the rider did, and in blue his bike. And in green we can see the prediction, so the maximum distance that uh, the rider should do before stopping. And we can see that all four crashes were appropriate inside the, the calculation. In another corner, um, like T9, we had four other crashes, and also these four other crashes, four, five, sorry, four in T9 and one in T10, were all inside the predicted model. And we can go on on all the racetrack, because in every of 36 race, crash, uh, race crashes, even the unpredictable one, we were inside the predictable uh, calculation. But this was not a, a, a surprise because this system was already applied in other racetrack since 2007. 
In 2011, we got this crash in Emola just after the brand new Variante Basso protection and the rider that flew at more than 200 kph did a trajectory that was perfectly assessed and predicted and he stopped just 20 meters before the, the placement of the barrier that was designed not for a stock 1000 but was designed for MotoGP so it would allow to protect a faster crash. This system is something that is going much more into uh, a comprehensive system to understand circuit safety about risk analysis. What they do when it happened a crash like this that was um, for example in, uh, in Mugello last year this was Mark Marquez the world champion that fell at more than 200 kph, we can see that the crash was a little weird. So the first question is, was it a predictable crash? No, it wasn't. It wasn't a predictable because he just made a mistake that could happen in every point of a track. What was predictable was to understand which other are the passive risk in case of an unpredictable case like that and the passive risk were those for example at around 270 kph Mark Markets went on a verge with very near to a pole and two marshals that were unprotected a bit later around 20, 220 kph three people were standing in front of the debris fence unprotected we can see it here in the high-speed camera the three people were just in front with the bike that was running at more than 220 kph and this is not safe we have to understand that that debris could fly very high and hit a, a bystander outside the first line of protection and this would not be acceptable so what we are going to do in every race track is to do a, a risk index. The risk index is calculated every 5 meters of the race track depending on the probability that a crash would happen and the magnitude of the impact of the rider into the first or the second line of protection. What we can see here is a scale between 0 and 16. If we have an index below 9, we have an acceptable risk. Between 9 and 12, we need to be uh, with a careful attention. And, but if you have indexes more than 12, an intervention is required as soon as possible. In this case, the index of efficiency um, of this track is 0 0.953 is 9 953 on 1000 meaning 1000 no possibility of crashes on the first line of protection for the body uh, in full race track about riders protections in 2013 I ran the first research about comparison of the protective equipment based on 865 crashes on the MotoGP World Championship the report tried to answer a question like how many crashes did each single manufacturer sustain what is the average crash ratio per rider in the season or in which body part have the MotoGP World Championship riders suffered most injuries and the results were quite interesting the number of fractures were only 31 with 11 head contusion or concussion 88 percent of the crashes were done on single riders by single riders and 12 percent on more than one rider together and the injuries sustained were 27 percent located in the area of the hand wrist and so on 18 on the shoulder 15 on the foot and 14 on the head. This brilliant result was, was achieved also because 
the extensive use of airbags. Airbags that now are working very beautifully, like in this case. This crash happened in Mugello the, earlier this year. The bike of Kurt Crutcher hit the bike of Stefan Bradl and you can see that he bounced a lot of times on the gravel and the tarmac itself, okay? What is interesting is that if we look frame by frame, you can see that now in this frame the, the suit is already deflated, the airbag is not inflated and just a couple of frames after is totally inflated. You can see that it is completely inflated because it's now bigger the shoulder. And you can see now again in, in the sequence how is bouncing. The first bounce is with airbag completely inflated. So this is just to say that we can protect riders with racing technologies. We know that manufacturers there are manufacturers that are pioneer in racing airbag technologies. Those are Pinestar and Dainese that uh, worked on motorcycle racing leather suits and airbags with different philosophy. Um, but we are going to talk today, I know that they will talk later, um, specifically on Dainese because they apply the same system on Alpine ski racing and street motorcycling. But more on this later on. What is important to me is to understand if those airbags are good to protect also, also in everyday crashes and uh, in everyday barriers. This is an example. I'm running a, a, a series of uh, crashes, a crash test on regular barriers thanks to IZECO that is partnering with um, to have this kind of knowledge. And I'm really keen to understand if those airbags are good also to uh, protect against this kind of crashes. Of course, road safety pass through standards that are ISO 39000 or IRAP. It is an international standard. We are currently doing a lot of extensive risk analysis on road safety and the way that we are doing is through comprehensive road laser scanning. This is an example of a road uh, on my backyard that we are um, trying to understand on risk. This is a point cloud and this is the same road where we run the, the automated analysis to understand point by point which are the risk and the threat for the user. Like here we can see signals, poles, rigid obstacles, but even surfaces, issues are everyday threats. Looking at the cloud point we can discover also road geometry and other road design issues and compile a road analysis sector by sector like we did and we do every day for circuits. We can see here that we take in consideration all the uh, different uh, behaviors, crash statistic, analysis, geometry and rigid obstacles to compile a, a risk diagram exactly as we do in circuits based on standard. Uh, if we see a two um, stars we have an intervention required in red, attention required in orange and is an acceptable risk on yellow or in uh, uh, green. Obviously if we found something with one star we have to change something very big. So just concluding the Dromos roadmap to support motorcycling safety. Our next steps are divided in two about circuits, is supporting a campaign of various crash tests, monitoring and improving knowledge on racing rider injuries and designing new and assisting racetrack with best practices and Droka certified system along to apply extensively risk analysis. This approach would be used also on road. So using Drokas to understand road risk, improving knowledge on rider injuries, applying extensive analysis on actual roads and increasing awareness of road dangers. This to support action for safety improvements 
and studies. So that's all. Thank you everybody for listening and please remember that my door is always wide open to your question or your request. You can just mail me at info at studiodromo.it. Thank you everybody and see you next time.